Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Sonia Triviglini, and I'm here to share with you some online success tips for online studying, online connecting remotely, and also thriving here in this new online world we're in. Now, in the chat, uh, there is the link to the slides that I'm going to be presenting. So please do follow along uh, and those are available for you so that you don't have to write everything down. Also, if you have any questions at any point, do pop them into the Q&A and we'll answer them as we go. And then there's also specific times during the presentation where we'll pause and just wait for any questions that might pop up in your mind. <clears throat> So as I said, welcome to the Online Success Workshop with me, Dr. Sonia Traviglini. I'm the Learning and Success Specialist with the Engineering Student Services team, and you can also follow up with me anytime at traviglini at berkeley.edu. <clears throat> So today, what we're really going to be focusing on is three main topics. The first is tips for those effective online studies. The second is strategies to optimize you connecting remotely to people, peers and opportunities. And then thirdly, we'll be looking at ideas to help you adapt to this new online academic life. We'll have a couple of minutes where this is the welcome and I'll give you a little bit of background as to why I'm so fascinated with uh, learning and studying. And then we'll have around 40 minutes of talking and plenty of time for questions. And again, if you do think of any questions at any point, please drop them into the Q&A function. And again, if you haven't already, do check out these notes. And I encourage you to with our first study tip of the day, which is if you find yourself struggling with engagement, uh, or maybe you're a little bit tired, it's towards the end of the week and the end of the day, uh, try drawing some notes. Uh, navigate either using the presentation link or you can hold your phone to that QR code up on the screen and that will take you to our notes that we're using today. Feel free to download a copy for yourself and perhaps annotate it with your own thoughts and ideas or indeed draw and follow along uh, with visual notes, which is something we'll be exploring later. So to give you a little background about me and why I'm so fascinated with online studies, uh, I'm an engineer myself from UC Berkeley, go Bears, uh, and I studied a PhD in mechanical engineering here. Um, and I've really always been interested, uh, if you can't hear originally, I'm from England, and I've always been interested in making things and figuring out how to do things uh, and followed product design and innovation and advanced manufacturing. Uh, I then got very interested in sign language, so quite different to engineering, uh, and came here to, to America just down the road, well, it used to be just down the road, in Berkeley City College, uh, and I was studying American Sign Language, ASL, which is actually different uh, to British Sign Language, BSL, uh, and I was just very interested in those languages. Uh, through some interesting twists and turns, I ended up back in engineering uh, and joined UC Berkeley for my PhD. And that's where I got really interested in learning through all of the teaching I was doing. And now uh, I work with the engineering student services team here at UC Berkeley, and I'm their uh, learning and success specialist. So I'm really focused on how people learn, how you optimize learning, and really just making the best possible experience you can through your academic life here at Berkeley. Now I know it's the end of the day, and we're probably all a bit worn out, and it, uh, it is the end towards the end of the week as well, and we're going into a holiday weekend. So I'd like to invite you to just take one minute to take a little de-stress, just a quick breather, if you'd like to join me for this 60 seconds, so we can relax our brains and get ready to be in that learning mode. Hi. Welcome to Head. Let me just ensure here that uh, we can actually hear the sound. There we go, that should be better now. Hi, and welcome to Headspace. So, no matter what's going on in your life right now, no matter how many thoughts are racing around your mind, no matter how the body's feeling, just take a moment to sit down 
and take a big deep breath, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. As you breathe in, a sense of taking in fresh air, the lungs expanding. As you breathe out, a sense of letting go of any stress in the body, in the mind, just feeling the muscles soften and relax. And close your eyes if you'd like to one more, breathing deeply in through the nose and out through the mouth. And just take a moment to pause, allow the thoughts to come and go, and then just gently opening the eyes again. Well, welcome back, everyone, and hopefully you found even just that 60 seconds of de-stress as de-stressing as I did. And that's the second study tip for today, is that learning and being online is wearing and can be stressful. So do take just little checkpoints through the day to help yourself feel better and give your moment, uh, give your body and your mind a moment to relax. So let's focus on our first topic, which is tips for effective online studies. And again, if you want to follow along the notes, the QR screen is on the code. Now, the first thing I want to mention is that learning is pretty hard and it's a forever work in progress. So be kind to yourself. You're here at Berkeley, which is one of the nation's top institutions and it is always a struggle with learning in one way or another and you can really think of yourself like a learning athlete your body your mind and all those challenges in life are all going to factor into your performance so do be forgiving of yourself and do see each day as a new opportunity to give it a go I also wanted to talk a bit about why we focus so much on study skills and why learning science is important in relation to this. Now there's many different approaches to learning and explaining how it works, uh, but at a basic sense, no one is 100% sure exactly how that happens in the brain. And there's many different models people use in order to understand learning. The reason these are useful is that they can help us really reframe and reflect and understand how us as an individual best learns. So we have different, uh, different topics such as behavioralism, which is very much about training your brain. Think about that Pavlov experiment. Uh, for example, if you sing the ABCs, you're really uh, teaching your brain to associate a particular tune with a particular piece of learning. There's also cognitivism, which is really thinking of your brain rather like a computer. So data in, processing data out. And there's constructivism as well, which is the idea of building up new knowledge piece by piece like bricklaying, so that you start with a simpler concept and layer on more complexity. And then I'm also very interested in active learning, which is very much about engaging with knowledge and using it in a legitimate way. So for example, instead of just looking at an equation on a page, actually using that equation in a way that you would use in class or perhaps you might use in the future as an engineer, as a way to make multiple connections in the brain for how that learning actually gets situated in there. Now, if this topic is really fascinating you, do check out Pedagogy, the study of teaching and learning. And a great resource for this is UC Berkeley's How Students Learn Project by the GSI Teaching and Resource Centre, who go into this in a great depth. But I really wanted to just flag it up as we can really think of learning as quite a complex topic and figuring out how you best do that, especially online, is helpful if we understand what's going on in the brain. This means that everyone really has their own individual learning style and that means what will work best for you might not work for another person and vice versa. There really isn't any right way to study online or indeed in any way of learning. Only what is the most efficient for you. Now for some people this means very structured times and for other people this can mean a lot more amorphous. It can also change with the topic you're learning and the time of day and even your mood. 
can also change with how the classes, for example, lecture classes will give you uh, a much more challenge in terms of creating your own active engagement, whereas discussion classes really rely on that active participation in order to be able to get that learning going. A good tip for figuring out your own particular learning style is to keep a study diary, figuring out where, when and what exactly worked and resulted in you feeling confident in your learning or indeed resulted in good learning uh, and exactly what didn't. So when you're thinking about when you like to learn, how you like to learn, or in particular, which classes you've enjoyed or modes of uh, particular learning, noting that down can help really discover those patterns over time. And then you can fit the way you learn to the particular uh, mode that's best for you. So for example, one way of looking at learning is through visual, auditory, verbal, and practical kinetic. So visual learners, and I count myself as a visual learner, are definitely more apt to remember images. So for example, for me, visual notes are very useful. I really am able to remember videos well. And I also use the tip of if I have a whole set of equations that I need to learn, uh, I put them onto one page, copy it, and then I'll stick it up around the home at places I just sort of an vacantly staring at while I'm busy. For me, that's the front door of my microwave. When I'm microwaving my cup of tea, uh, I'm just kind of staring at the microwave and you'd be surprised how much information goes in while you're just passively taking in information like that. <clears throat> If you find you're really, really good at recording tunes and conversations and you tend to be an auditory type person, you may find memory tricks like mnemonics quite useful. Or you may find it more handy to listen to your lecture notes passively. So if it's an asynchronous lecture, you can download those and watch those later. Or you can go online if they're synchronous and listen to it while also perhaps writing some notes. Now, one method here to reflect on your learning and really also check where your learning is at is what they use in computer science called the rubber ducky method. And this is because typically you get an object, often a, a rubber ducky from a bathroom, but it could be anything. It, it could be even perhaps your cup of tea and you explain to it the topic that you're learning. So for example, if I was learning about an equation, I would explain to the object or my rubber ducky exactly what it was and how it's done. The reason this is a powerful learning method is because it helps you not only reflect on what you do know and don't know, because if you don't know it, you can't explain it very well, but it also helps create different connections in the brain because you're using different parts of your cognition while actually putting the information together from recall into discourse and explanation. If you're a practical learner and you find that doing things is what really helps gets your memory going, you may find attaching ideas to particular places quite useful. So for me, during exams, I would put all of my equations on a piece of paper on the top right hand corner. And this is going back to that behavioralism type of model of learning, which is really training your brain to expect a particular response or a particular stimulus. So then when I wanted to remember equations, because I would automatically look towards that area, it helps my brain get into the mode to begin recall. And in a similar way, you can use objects and you may find making particular routines or reminders very helpful. So, for example, if you like making lots of notes, using a particular set of pens or pencils will effectively train your brain to be more likely to learn and more comfortable learning when it knows that you're going to be doing it because you're using a particular set of objects. I also wanted to point up the difference between this active learning and passive learning. So when we learn, our memory has rather like uh, hard drives and RAM chips, short term and long term memory. When we take in information, we have a sort of buffer of our short term, our, our RAM, and then it gets filed and connected into our long term memory, our hard drives. And this means that when we take in information, sometimes the information doesn't quite make it over into the long term storage or perhaps the tags on it uh, that recall what it's connected to don't quite form up. So it's a really good idea to not only uh, help yourself really classify that information as 
background thinking about recording it, but also testing where that information is. So again, that rubber ducky method is a great one. If you uh, can't explain it, you're probably not recalling it. And also test yourself in the conditions you expect to use that knowledge. So for example, if you check out the syllabus of the class and it says that it will be a take home exam, then try practicing just one question from a take home exam just every now and then to get your brain used to those kind of feelings. We also have what's called neuroplasticity in our brain, which is a, a fancy word for saying how much we learn and how much we can change the brain. Our brains are pretty great at learning. That's kind of what they're built for. And it means that we're able to remap how they do things. If you make a regular recall structure, so for example, if you look at notes just once, it's probably less likely than you're going to recall it than if you looked at it every day or regularly. It sounds obvious, uh, but it can be a good idea to actually make a schedule for yourself to check knowledge out and keep reflecting and coming back to it. And again, a great way to check your learning and see if these methods are actually working is to try teaching someone a topic. Maybe you have a fellow classmate uh, or maybe you have uh, someone in your living area who doesn't mind being uh, used as a bit of a guinea pig. And you can actually try and teach them what you're learning, which is the quickest way through to mastery of a subject because it really helps you find what you feel comfortable explaining and the bits you're not quite sure about. Just taking a pause here to check the Q&A and check there isn't any questions there, looking good. Now, a lot of people find that staying engaged in lectures online can be quite a challenge, especially if you have hours of Zoom. And towards the end of the day, uh, I too tend to get a little bit tired and my, my attention can wander. A great way to stay engaged with online lectures is to actually draw out what is happening. If you're really good at art, maybe you can do something like a comic book style. Uh, if you're like me and you're terrible at drawing, it's more likely to be just some simple stick men and simple drawings, maybe even doodles next to some notes. And those can be done digitally, digitally by annotating a presentation or indeed, if you prefer paper and pen, you can make notes on paper and actually draw along with it. This can be also used for visual notes. So you turn what's happening into the lecture into a set of pictures and simple uh, summarized information. And again, this is really good for learning because in the brain, we're not just doing recall, we're now having to categorize summarize and output information and you're actually engaging a whole second mode of learning and cognitivism which is that drawing function which is accessing different parts of the brain which increases learning. Now this is an example of the uh, a lecture about the 50-50 rule which is when you're making visual notes make it about half text half images and this one's quite a good drawing on your screen. Uh, mine are never quite so neat and, and mostly are quite doodlish but the idea here is to keep yourself engaged with what's going on by literally drawing out what's happening. In the same way especially if you have lectures that tend to have a lot of information or many disparate topics being covered try making a concept map. So in the centre would go the particular topic that's being discussed and this could be a big broad topic such as the course itself uh, or it could be a particular concept you're learning about in a specific lecture. And then around this central point go the big sort of concepts related to that. So for example if it was dynamics and we were talking about acceleration perhaps acceleration would be the topic in the centre and then around it would be the different definitions of that, what it's used for, and equations, things like that. These are also really good, not only to keep you engaged, but they're very handy to distill information out into a revision guide. So whether or not you have end exams at the end, it's a really good idea to distill your notes into your own personal revision guide. And top tip, at Berkeley, especially many of the engineering classes, repetitively use particular concepts and equations. So if you're learning something, for example, in dynamics, 
or in a mathematics class, you may well see the same method or concept pop back up in those future classes. So having a ready-made revision guide that you can flip back to if you need a reminder is a great time saver. Now I'm going to take a moment here uh, to access all the expertise in the room that you have. Uh, so you're obviously brilliant scholars because you're here already. So let's share your best online study tips. Perhaps you found something that particularly works for you or you heard something that you thought was pretty useful. You can go to menti.com forward slash 5SJJ891052. Uh, actually, I think that's an O, not a zero. Uh, or you can go to menti.com and just put in the code 82628269. Or indeed, you can hold your smartphone up to the screen there and that QR code will take you straight to the survey. So I'm going to unshare here so that we can look at the results. There we go. And take a quick check of any Q&As. Looking good. And here come the results already. Marvellous. Well, thank you for this share. Take screenshots if you can't catch up with the professor. What a fantastic tip. Absolutely brilliant. That's really good because sometimes lecturers and professors do just speed through things. Uh, so that's very handy. And I personally uh, use the keyboard shortcuts, control C for copy um, and control V for paste or print screen and then control V for paste into a Word document. Also the share, stay hydrated. Another great, great share there, thank you. It's true, your physical body and indeed the level of hydration does impact your learning to a surprising degree. So do look after yourself. A great idea there, linking back to those learning philosophies, those learning models we thought about earlier, using different colors is a great way to add different layers of information. Thank you for that share. Wow, here is a great one. Thank you for this one too. Practice full length exams, especially those that are proctored. Fantastic. You may find that the slightly perhaps stressful conditions of exams may change how your brain deals with learning and handling information. So emulating those circumstances can get your brain used to recalling and using information in that particular circumstance. Here's another great share. I downloaded lectures into a PDF and wrote on it. Uh, you can type notes out and condense and rewrite them. Thank you. Another one, schedule your free time to avoid gaps with no activity in order to stay on top of everything. Pretty impressive there. That's pretty intense. Perhaps also add to that scheduling in some rewards as well and time to look after your mental health and well-being too. Take quick standing breaks during long lectures. Absolutely, great share there, thank you. Uh, indeed, apparently we are not supposed to stay sedentary, sitting for more than 20 minutes at any time. So even just a few minutes to stand up and stretch is a great way to get the oxygen going in your body and keep your brain oxygenated. Before starting a lecture, look back at previous lectures to make connections. This is fantastic and it's going back to that constructivism model where we layer in information. And this is also a very good uh, teaching uh, tip is that if you connect back to knowledge before you start adding new knowledge, your recall is much better. So thank you for that share. We also have uh, make study groups. That's a brilliant suggestion and we'll be going into that a little bit more in detail. This is a great one here. Thank you for sharing this. Create a mental or perhaps even physical image of who you want to be as a scholar and work towards that image. Great idea. This is a very powerful technique for visualization and can really help you um, perhaps combat those feelings of stress uh, and, and challenge that we go through in learning by concentrating and visualizing you perhaps with your graduation hat on or perhaps in your engineering job earning all that delicious money. Uh, so that's a great suggestion there, thank you. Again, reflecting on notes after lecture is really good. It helps make all those connections. And someone suggested, thank you for that share, practice the entire setup of a proctored exam. Good thinking there is often the mechanics of actually getting into exams, etc., can be difficult. For example, making sure that you, you know, only have that particular thing open on your screen so you get used to not being able to click into your resources. 
rewatch lectures if, uh, if, if needed. That's a really good suggestion there as well, because again, the more you reflect, the more you bring that recall schedule, uh, the more that embeds it in your brain. Great suggestion here too of exercising to reduce stress. Indeed, uh, very good for your health as well as your mental health, uh, because it really just promotes good all round well-being. And there's another great suggestion, thank you, uh, for assignments that require writing. Oh, we're jumping around a little bit as people add. For assignments that require writing. Uh, uh, let's press enter to uh, get ourselves down to the bottom here. Keep ideas organized before writing a paper. That's a really good idea. And I actually use post-it notes to do that. So I will get a piece of a uh, letter, <laughs> letter paper in America, and actually use post-it notes as um, each concept or thing I want to include. And I will actually stick them onto the page. And that will help me also figure out where I want them to go for the structure. So thank you for that share. And again, another one that's a really good one. Thank you for this. Uh, find practice problems online. Great suggestion. Of course, there's often many offered by your instructors or indeed you can always reach out to your GSI. Uh, and then there's another good one, listening to soothing music. Absolutely. If you have a particular uh, song or a particular setting that helps you learn, that's a great one. Well, thank you so much for sharing all these tips and tricks. They're absolutely brilliant and indeed have covered some of the best uh, information we have. So let's keep going here. I'm just gonna take a pause to check if there's any questions and invite you, if you have any questions in particular, to pop them into the Q&A. Okay, let's keep going. And indeed, if you think of them during this, uh, do ask away at any point. So now we're going to focus on strategizing to connecting remotely. Now this is a bit different than being physically on campus and that really changes how exactly we create our networks. Creating online connections is a bit new for everyone. And the key trick here is to just really up the number and volume of outreaching you're doing. This is kind of great in a way, the online world, because people are a bit more open to having perhaps a quick call or a quick Zoom, as it's really lowered that barrier to scheduling. <clears throat> so people are often quite willing to chat with you, both GSIs, professors, uh, people who are looking after affinity groups, perhaps even people from industry uh, are always interested in chatting to you. And even if they're not asking, uh, it can be a good idea just to find out if they are. Now, top tip here, whenever you're reaching out to someone, do your research and have a good idea of exactly what they do and perhaps what they could offer you and have one specific agenda item that you're going to focus on. So, for example, if I was reaching out uh, to a GSI rather than saying, hmm, you know, I'm feeling a bit lost in the class, uh, what, what should I focus on? What I do is actually have a look at the syllabus, have a look at the topics and then just pick one or two that I'd like to go through with them and then keep going back until I've got the info I want. It's also a good idea to have one single clear ask that you want from them and this is especially important for industry. Professors, academics, GSIs tend to be able to kind of go through more questions and multitask but in industry they often only have maybe 10 minutes on a call or maybe it's just one email connection. So having a single clear ask, maybe it's an informational interview to talk about them with what they do in their job, uh, maybe it's connecting with a colleague or grabbing a virtual coffee, uh, having one clear thing that you want from them helps them be more likely to get that. Another great uh, method you can use to think about all of your online connections is to actually treat it a bit like a project manager. So in very complex projects, perhaps a startup, you know, out here in the Bay Area, they actually do a process called stakeholder mapping. And this is where we think of all of the connections we have, uh, indeed connections who are useful, uh, in relation to our whole kind of world. And right at the core, you have things like classes. They're the ones that you're typically always in or you go to regularly, or you can count on always being there in a particular time slot. 
further out, you have things that are maybe not scheduled, but are quite useful, such as your department. There's also then the wider Berkeley bubble. This includes all of those clubs. Uh, it includes all of the sort of different student services organizations that are about there to help. And then further than that are our outside connections, not connected to Berkeley in any particular way. Maybe it's your past institutions, maybe it's your friends and family. Now the process of stakeholder mapping is we not only define these regions and they might be different for you. For example, it might be uh, friend groups and then classes and then maybe a particular program you're involved with. And what we do is we try and think of all of the people we contact that are particularly helpful or could help us with things. So for example, in your class, that might be your GSI, a great contact point, or maybe course mates that you've connected with who you could drop a line into chat or connect with afterwards to maybe study together. In your department, it could be departmental advisors or perhaps the student council or student activities that are done inside the department. For example, in mechanical engineering, we have ASME, the, the American Society of Mechanical Engineering, and they're great connection points. In the Berkeley bubble, uh, you may also have social clubs, uh, things that are not connected to academics at all, uh, and they may be on completely different topics to you or different programs, but they might be good to be encouraging. So these resources are not just academic resources, they can be 360, all parts of life resources. And then of course, friends, families, previous people that you really connected well with, maybe favorite teachers, those are all good. The reason we go through this process is to really identify the ones that are giving us the most help or find new ones that you might want to try. So for example, maybe you're doing really good at working with your GSI and course mates, uh, but you haven't really connected to anything in the department. Using this process and regularly reviewing it, maybe even just once a month or just every now and then as and when you remember can be very helpful to not only find new resources, but it can remind you who to reconnect with and also get a sense of where you should be investing your time. You can also classify these as well. So if some of them are particularly critical, like you could use color, for example, red for a GSI. And if you think they're kind of fun, but they're not really that helpful, but you enjoy them, you could do them a different color like yellow for clubs. Now, when you have thought about all of the stakeholder mapping and you found the people that you really think are useful and would like to concentrate on, it's a really good idea to establish those regular connections. And you can think of creating regular updates for each of those zones of the stakeholder mapping. So for example, you might have a professional zone. These are things like LinkedIn, Twitter, um, perhaps professors, people where you are definitely representing yourself as a professional, um, either in industry or within academia. Now, it's a good idea that sometimes you may actually need to repeat these. So if you post uh, maybe an article or an update on LinkedIn, it's a good idea, maybe after two or three days or within a week, to pop back in and repeat that process so that anyone that missed it the first time catches it on the second. It's also a good idea to make regular updates within your Berkeley bubble, like check out your Handshake account, check out your Careers account, and just make sure all the information in there is up to date. And same with clubs too, do check in and see if they have any activities that you can connect to. And of course your personal bubble. So do uh, check there and see if you could say, send a monthly email round robin to people who are particularly helpful or even pick up the phone uh, to some of your good friends and update there. I'm just gonna check for any questions again. Looking good. And again, it's quite obvious, but it's worth saying, prioritize those most useful connections so that using your time is well, uh, well utilized. And then if you can, automate this process as much as you can. So rather like social media managers for startups, there are programs, some free, some paid for out there, Boomerang, which can automatically schedule Gmail messages, and Hootsuite, which can manage multiple social media accounts. Now, when I say social media accounts, I mean professional social media accounts. Uh, you probably already know this, but the uh, accounts that you post on related to your learning or your career, or perhaps 
looking for internships are usually not your personal ones. They're ones where you represent yourself as a personal, professional persona. And again, don't forget the power of the follow-up. Uh, so if you have a good conversation with someone, it is a brilliant idea to make sure you just follow up with a quick email to say thank you. Or if you've worked with someone, for example, a GSI, a quick check-in to keep that rolling communication going. And if it's a longer term one, perhaps look at perhaps a past internship or a past professor and just drop them a quick line to update and say, wow, you know, I've really been enjoying this particular topic. It reminds me of how I enjoyed that particular topic you taught. Just a quick missive, a quick update, and that could help keep those um, places to get support and options and resources keeping on going. And you can also explore deep end departmental lists. Uh, you can explore other departments lists. For example, Citrus has an open list that you can join. Uh, they're a group on campus, a building on campus, and a program who, who do all sorts of exciting things as an example. You can join professional societies in your own institution, and you can use that to connect to other professional societies at other institutions, which will open more doors. Affinity groups is also great within STEM. Maybe there's a particular group you identify with that will add another layer of places to connect. And of course, you can always look backwards as well. Maybe reach out to your prior institution, maybe your favorite teacher there, as a lot of jobs are got through personal connections. And they may even have other resources other than career focused ones, which can be useful. Now just make a regular time to do it. Maybe it's an hour, maybe even just 10 minutes. If you don't have time, just use 10 minutes, maybe once a month to update your LinkedIn and that will continue to grow all those connections. And then of course, focus your efforts on the connections that reward you the most. And again, just checking if there's any questions. I think we're good, but I like to make sure if there's any, looks like we're doing good. Again, if you have them at any point, uh, do ask away. Otherwise, we'll just keep rolling. And now we're going to look at some more generalized tips and tricks and ideas to be able to help you to adapt to this online academic life. Now, it is a very new world that we're in, and that doesn't just mean you, that means the instructors as well. Uh, it can be difficult for professors. Maybe this is the first time they've ever worked online. Uh, maybe this is the first time a GSI has talked online. So do remember that and do keep in good communication. If there's something that's not really working for you, maybe the professor appears to be eating the microphone or he's talking up over there and you can never really hear him, be sure to share that feedback. It's also quite difficult to keep self-care going if you're stuck to a screen all day. So with that top tip that one of our wonderful attendees shared earlier, do stand up and take a break every now and then. Create these rituals around self-care and learning. Uh, for me, my particular one is making a cup of tea before I'm about to study, and that helps calm me down for learning because uh, it's always a little stressful and also helps remind me to keep hydrated. In a similar way, you may be living in a situation where you really don't have a separate study space or maybe a lot is going on around you and you can't really get peace and quiet. Try using headphones, earphones to make that own quiet space. You could also try wearing a particular set of clothing. Uh, so if you get up in the morning, uh, hop out of those PJs and hop into a working set of clothes. And that will really, again, train your brain, thinking of that behavioralism type of uh, cognitive learning that will get your brain ready to go. And as someone mentioned earlier with another top tip, music can do. And I've also heard people using a particular scent. Uh, so some people perhaps might have a particular perfume that they wear, or perhaps they just have a particular incense, or maybe even just the aroma of coffee uh, can help make your brain really good at remembering stuff and connect to that learning. And of course, schedule blocks of time, not just for the learning and the lectures, but also to give yourself time to reflect. So again, thinking back to one of those top tips someone shared earlier, if you take time to digest the information and reflect back, you will increase the amount of learning you're doing. 
And one thing I found that was quite useful is if you have multiple calendars going, maybe you have your B courses Gmail account, maybe you have your personal Gmail account, maybe you have an Outlook account, you can actually slot those all together to make one unified place to be able to remove that mental burden of figuring out when I have to be doing something. If you don't like to do it digital, maybe try retro and go with a good old pen and paper journal. This can be good as well as it actually makes your brain think about things if you have to write it down. Uh, this is good for those kinetic learners as well. And so that can be a way of getting all of everything that has to be done and schedule it in one place so you're organizing the time that you have. Working in groups is also a really good way of dividing and conquering the amount of work you have to do. A good idea is if you have uh, teammates or maybe classmates, and if you don't, maybe reach out to them and connect, to make a shared Google Doc and crowdsource your notes. So everyone can take a different role. For example, with those visual notes, one person could be writing things down while another person is annotating and then halfway through, switch it over. It's very important if you're working in groups to make sure that work is distributed equally or you're all participating together to make sure that you're not just farming out your work. And again, this is a great way to try that top tip there of teaching each other a topic. Perhaps something just clicks for you, you just get it. Maybe you could try and teach other people that. That'll check your own learning and also help and vice versa. If there's a topic you don't get, ask around there's a good chance someone would like the opportunity to put on that teaching hat and help you learn. Another good idea, because everything is online and often we're remote from our family and friends and supporters too, is to mix in social time as well as work time. So perhaps if you're too busy to schedule Zoom meetings with your friends, make a lunch time where you get together on Zoom and bring your lunch or even just a quick five minute check in before an assignment or before a class can help not only get you centered to learn, but also help you create connections. And of course, if you are working as a group, you should be making goals for your group and do reflect at the end of each session or time you spend together to see if you hit those. It's very easy to get into chatting uh, and, and miss the points or perhaps not cover everything you wanted, but making clearly defined goals that you're all aware of and come up with together and then seeing whether or not you've hit them is a great way to make sure that you keep the progress going. Now, one question I get asked a lot is how do I manage my time? And we're gonna look at this in two ways. <clears throat> one of them is conceptually, and one of them is practically. Now, we're often engineers, uh, and we often do things as an engineering way. So if you're thinking about building your time successfully in a conceptual way, there is a particular method we can use to help categorize different tasks in our brain to help our brain figure out what to do when. And this actually helps de-stress you as well because it then lifts off the burden of figuring out what you should be doing, especially if you're overwhelmed with work. So we can imagine that our lives, the time we have, the time that we're not perhaps sleeping, eating or you know, existing, is a jar. And some things have to be put into this jar, all these different tasks that we have to do. And there's rocks, pebbles, and sand. Now, rocks are tasks that are absolutely critical to the construction of life. These could be very key assignments, especially if you're doing something uh, where it's a large percentage of a course, or it might be something very, very important to you. And of course, eating, sleeping, adequate hydration, uh, taking care of yourself is also a rock. And they go into that container, into that jar first. The next thing is pebbles. Those are smaller tasks that aren't as critical, but are still very important. Those are typically things like reflection, updating notes, those social media or, uh, ideas we had earlier, outreaching to different connections, uh, connecting back with other people. All of these smaller tasks that aren't critical to you passing a course, but are still very important. And those get fit into the jar around those big rocks. And usually there's less room for them, of course, than there is rocks. 
And then finally, there is sand. And sand are the type of activities that could just take up your whole world. It's so easy to get lost into a YouTube rabbit hole, or at least it is for me, uh, or maybe even an email rabbit hole. So if you start trying to, you know, sift through your email or clear out your inbox, it can be quite a, quite a challenge. Sand are all those tasks that are pretty much never ending. Uh, washing is one of them. <laughs> washing clothes, uh, email for me is one of the worst. And the idea here is that if we sprinkle sand in last into that jar, it means that it doesn't take up all of our time. And it happens only after we've addressed those rocks, the pebbles, and whatever is left is the gap between those. Uh, so in a very similar way, perhaps you begin your day with a scheduled set time for a rock that's working on a critical assignment. And after you feel like you've done a good chunk of that, maybe take a moment or two to focus, maybe just for 20 minutes on something like outreach or updating your LinkedIn. And then lastly, trickle in throughout the day, if you can, little bits of clearing your inbox or connecting to people, or of course, taking a break too. Now, for some people, this conceptual uh, process is just not cutting the mustard. And many engineers prefer actual processes to go through. And I myself am one of them. I love lists and I love flowcharts. And these are some methods that people often use to be able to schedule and control work, especially when there's a lot of it. One of them is called the sifted waterfall method, the sifted waterfall planning method. And this is used very heavily within project management. The idea is first making a master list of all of the tasks you need to do, literally all of them, everything from washing to cooking to emails to important bits of assignments. Literally unload everything you have to do onto that master list. And this will mean that you don't have to keep on kind of keeping everything in your brain. Then have a look at those tasks and break down the sort of big chunks. So if it's a very large chunk as in a particular course, have a look at the syllabus and break that down into its assignments. Or if it's an assignment, break that down into particular chunks, such as making the Google Doc, finding the resources, planning out the essay, proofreading, etc, etc. And then sift these, assign a priority. Some people use colors, so you tag the most important ones highlighted yellow or red and uh, go down the list of colors. Or you can do a numbered system where one is critical rock style, I have to do this now, and then five is a, mm, I'll get to it later if I can. Then look through this master list each day with its priorities and every day have a look at it, review it, and make yourself a simple smaller to-do list for the day. And then as you get through that, tick them off, which I always find very satisfying, and build in rewards for actually doing that well. The other method is called critical path method and scrum. These are both heavily used in industry, particularly the computer science industry. The idea here is if there's so many tasks, there's just too many, you can go ahead and uh, find out the most critical tasks that you need to do and then figure out how long it's going to take, schedule the time to do them. And then, of course, <laughs> there's not time for everything sometimes. So lesser work may get cut off. For example, perhaps you don't have quite as much time for outreach this week. And that's the one task that you, you don't do. So let's review what we've looked at today. Our top takeaways for today is really have a think about your learning style. What works for you? Where works for you? And what makes your studying go well and what doesn't? Make study groups to divide and conquer and work and make sure that you make an agenda and reflect to fairly distribute all that work. Do check whether your studying is actually going into your brain by testing yourself. Flashcards are great. There are online softwares out there. Or try that rubber ducky method or teach a classmate to be able to test whether you're an active recall. Break down tasks into manageable to-do lists so you don't become overwhelmed. Uh, my, my master to-do list is often many pages, but I make a smaller list of just maybe three to five things that I know I can get done that day. And then I reward myself, maybe a little walk, maybe a cup of tea, maybe my favorite show to give me encouragement. 
and to stay engaged in lectures, try making visual notes, one page summaries, and do make regular time uh, to reflect back on your plans and also to do that outreach to connect to different resources and different people who can become your advocates and supporters. So in the last minute here, I hope you found this helpful today here with me, Dr. Sonia, looking at online success and we've reached our learning goals, hopefully found it useful. Perhaps you can think of something we could do different or we could add or change. There's a QR code on the screen and there's also in this presentation a link and we invite you to fill out an exit ticket. It's a quick form that just asks what went well and something we could add. So as we're in the last minute here, we'd love any questions, please. Maybe it's about studying, maybe it's about lives and uh, do fill in that exit ticket survey if you have time. And thank you very much for joining us today.